Does the shaman have a place in Confucianism and CIT? Shamans played an important role in Chinese religious history long before the time of Confucius. They have retained a place in Daoism and CCT, functioning as guides to the spirit world. But since Confucian teaching is far more concerned with how things are going in the outer world of ordinary human affairs, there have never been Confucian shamans as such. Shamans have generally been associated with folk and popular beliefs. As an important ingredient in CIT, Confucianism has often had a more aristocratic tone. However, some functions anciently connected with shamanism have had continuous importance throughout much of Chinese history for CIT as well as popular religion. Confucian literati and their imperial patrons alike have regularly consulted diviners, specialists in feng shui and astrology. For help in determining auspicious times and places for momentous events and structures. Does the shaman have a place in Shinto? In ancient times shamanesses were very important in Shinto circles. Today the shrine maidens, Maiko, may represent a vestige of that ritual specialization of long ago. Blind female shamans called Itako still ply their trade in various parts of Japan. Strict asceticism marks the apprenticeship of young blind girls to older teachers. After lengthy training the aspirant marries Akami symbolically to secure spiritual power and protection. Shamanesses perform the service of connecting with the Kami world. Sometimes functioning as spirit mediums. Some of the so-called new religions with Shinto roots give prominent roles to shamanesses. Ancient Shinto tradition associates certain forms of spirit possession with shamanesses. Explaining their extraordinary powers in special circumstances. Newer sects such as Tenrikyo acknowledge that male or female shamans experience a kami descent. Kami Gakari, in which the deity totally takes over the human being. Is music important in Daoist and CCT ritual? Music has been an essential ingredient in virtually all indigenous Chinese religious ritual for millennia. Students of Daoist masters are expected to begin their formal training by becoming Accomplished in the use of a full range of string, wind, and percussion instruments. These ancient devices include not only the mysterious booming gongs and bowed or pluck strings many readers may already associate with Asian music. But the less well-known woodwinds whose high reedy voices produce an almost eerie effect. Daoist ritual music has been related to imperial court music and, somewhat more recently, Chinese opera. Ritual music aims at stirring feelings uniquely appropriate to the occasion. In these last several respects, Daoist ritual music has much in common with the music that is an essential ingredient in many Shinto ceremonies in Japan. 
two percussion instruments used to keep time for chanting and recitation of scripture are virtually identical to those used for the same purpose in Buddhist ritual all over Asia. Large-scale chanting on especially solemn occasions is accompanied by an ensemble of four or more instruments of various types. Percussion instruments along with other wind and string instruments. Back up the lead played on oboe-like woodwinds, lutes, and bowed strings. When a single master recites a sacred text, a solo instrument is generally the only accompaniment. What is holy water and how do some Christians use it? Roman and Anglo-Catholics especially are accustomed to blessing themselves when they enter church. They dip their right hand into a font filled with holy water and make the sign of the cross on themselves. Water is also a medium of blessing for a congregation. The celebrant takes a branch, or uses a small sprinkler with a handle. Dipped in water and scatters a few drops over the crowd. Water from pilgrimage sites has long been a favorite religious souvenir. Sometimes brought home to be given away as gifts or used for its healing properties. For many Christians, this is all an extension of the use of water for the rite of baptism. Which in turn recalls how God brought the Israelites safely through the waters of the Red Sea and the Jordan River. And how Jesus was blessed by his cousin John the Baptist. What were the laws of Richard I to Crusaders traveling by sea, 1189 CE? At the time of the Crusades, Richard I issued the following laws to his soldiers traveling by sea. Richard by the grace of God King of England, and Duke of Normandy and Aquitaine and Count of Anjou, to all his subjects who are about to go by sea to Jerusalem, greeting. Know that we, by the common counsel of upright men, have made the laws here given. Whoever slays a man on shipboard shall be bound to the dead man and thrown into the sea. But if he shall slay him on land, he shall be bound to the dead man and buried in the earth. If anyone, moreover, shall be convicted through lawful witnesses of having drawn a knife to strike another, or of having struck him so as to draw blood, he shall lose his hand. But if he shall strike him with his fist without drawing blood, he shall be dipped three times in the sea. But if anyone shall taunt or insult a comrade or charge him with hatred of God, as many times as he shall have insulted him, so many ounces of silver shall he pay. A robber, moreover, convicted of theft, shall be shorn like a hired fighter. And boiling tar shall be poured over his head, and feathers from a cushion shall be shaken out over his head. So that he may be publicly known. And at the first land where the ships put in he shall be cast on shore. Under my own witness at Shinan. Are there religious hierarchical structures in any branch of Hinduism?
none of Hinduism's various denominations has ever developed a formal institutional hierarchy parallel to those of for example, Roman Catholicism, or Shiite Islam. But there have been de facto social rankings in which some representatives of the tradition have very definite priority. In Vedic times, there were at least seven, and perhaps as many as sixteen. Different types of priests, distinguished according to specific function in the Vedic sacrifice. Among them were the Brahmins. The one category of priests that has retained its influence over the centuries. Hindu religious hierarchy has generally ranked its specialists according to learning. With teachers and guardians of tradition, such as gurus, acharyas, and pundits, ranking high on the list. Historically, figures called the Purohita served as high priests at the courts of Hindu monarchs. That individual's role was to protect his royal patron through ritual and teaching, as well as by his spiritually potent presence. In modern times the Purohita has become the family priest. Charged with keeping caste and ritual practices intact. Temple priesthood staffs typically have chief priests. Who supervise the overall running of the temple rituals. Have prophets played a role in Shinto tradition? Shinto tradition does not revolve around a revealed truth or set of beliefs considered inaccessible without divine intervention. Therefore, prophets have not figured prominently in its history. Arguably Shinto's closest functional analogy to the classic prophet are the various founders of sectarian groups who criticized the imperial system. Not unlike the prophets of the Semitic traditions. Some of them have played the role of an accusatory conscience, especially in modern times. What is the historical and religious significance of Tiananmen Square? In June of 1989, media coverage of the so-called Tiananmen Square massacre brought world prominence to one of China's most important public spaces. The huge plaza stands directly south of the Forbidden City and is named after the city's massive southern outer gate. The Gate of Heavenly Peace, Tiananmen, literally Heaven Peace Gate. In a matter of days the space had become a globally recognized symbol for a younger China's struggle for democracy. But Tiananmen Square had been a powerful symbol for the Chinese people for some years before 1989. Early Revolutionary publications spoke of the place as the people's guiding star, the emblem of the new China. Situated just south of the ancient seat of empire. The square was created as a clear revolutionary response to imperial repression. The open people's square was an obvious counterpoint to the exclusivity and mystery of the Forbidden City. Its placement to the south of the palace also meant that the square overpowered the palace by virtue 
of its greater access to yang energy a symbolism surely not lost on countless traditional Chinese. Mao Zedong and his communist colleagues preferred to play off their new symbols of power against the old. They could have chosen simply to destroy the trappings of the decadent regime. But they might thereby have risked investing the former symbols with even greater power in the popular imagination. Better to reduce them to the status of mere museums. In the square now stand. Communist Beijing's Great Hall of the People and the Museums of Chinese History and of the Chinese Revolution. Contemporary replacements for the old imperial symbolism. Between them and to the south stands the mausoleum of Chairman Mao, D. 1976, but facing north rather than south as the imperial centers had done for over 3,000 years. The goal of countless pilgrims today, Mao's memorial hall functions as a quasi-religious monument even in its rejection of China's imperial religious tradition. Are there Shinto rituals of marriage? Weddings in Japan have traditionally followed Shinto ritual, and the vast majority still include Shinto elements even when performed in connection with other traditions, such as Christianity. Until recent times, however, weddings occurred in homes and were performed by laypersons only. Since the mid-19th century, shrine nuptials performed by Shinto priests have been more common. A ceremony called Shinzenkeken, nuptials in the presence of kami, may take place in a wedding hall on shrine grounds or in other public spaces. According to some, a marriage deity called Musyubi no Kami, the god who ties the knot, is a Japanese counterpart to the moon-dwelling deist, Yulao, who bound together the feet of marriage partners. Many Japanese continue the ancient practice of arranged marriage. And some young couples still live with the groom's family, following Confucian traditions. At the heart of the wedding ceremony is a shared drink of sake, rice wine. Many Japanese families still value elaborate ritual as a form of social communication. And some will even have two ceremonies, one Shinto and one Christian, for example. Deist-influenced traditions still recommend that couples be wed only on days determined to be auspicious. Do Shinto practitioners run private schools for their children? Private schools equivalent to parochial educational systems in some other traditions have not been institutionally significant in the history of Shinto. Perhaps the closest thing to structured education in Shinto beliefs and values have been occasional government attempts to insert components of Shinto I.E. traditional or national Japanese ethics into school curricula. In 1937, for example, the Ministry of Education incorporated themes from an 1890 imperial document on education into a new ethics curriculum called Principles of the National Entity, Kokutai no Hangi, meant to implement the concept of state Shinto. 
The document emphasizes the historicity of the classic mythical narratives concerning the emperor's divine descent. It praises unquestioning dedication to the corporate good of the Japanese people under the virtuous rule of the emperor. These pre-war governmental actions, however, are entirely different from the grassroots impulses that gave rise to private religious schools in traditions such as Islam and Christianity. There is really no Shinto parallel. In fact, the Meiji and subsequent regimes attempt to teach ethics from on high. So to speak, explicitly forbade religious education on the local or shrine level. Since World War II, however, numerous shrines throughout Japan have developed. Programs for children and young people, including nursery schools and kindergartens. But these are exclusively social and cultural, rather than religiously educational, developments. What kind of religious calendar do Christians observe? Most of the world's Christians mark time on the solar Gregorian calendar. A late medieval correction of the much older Julian calendar. Julius Caesar had initiated the calendar named after him in 46 BCE. But it was based on some miscalculations. In 1582, Pope Gregory XIII shortened the Julian year by 10 days and added a day to February every fourth or leap year. Some Eastern Christian churches still use the Julian calendar so that their major feasts fall just less than two weeks later than those of the Western churches. Until the Gregorian reform, Christians considered March 25th the beginning of the year. Since that was judged to be the day on which Gabriel announced to Mary that she would give birth to Jesus. March 25th, which had in ancient times been mistakenly calculated as the spring equinox. The first day of spring, remains the Feast of the Annunciation. For centuries Christians continued to observe the timing of traditional Jewish feasts, which were movable within limits of specific agricultural seasons, such as planting and harvest times. Using the Jewish seven-day week, Christians gradually added fixed feasts, such as those of saints and martyrs. The custom of designating Sunday as a day of special religious observance began during the first generation after Jesus' death and Emperor Constantine decreed it a day of rest in 321. Wednesdays and Fridays had anciently been days of fasting. A practice now surviving largely on the first day of Lent, Good Friday, and other Fridays during Lent. For most Christians the year consists of three liturgical seasons. Advent and Christmas Tide, Lent and an Easter Tide that ends with Pentecost Sunday. And ordinary time until the first Sunday of the following Advent. Some Christians in Egypt and Ethiopia still use the solar Coptic calendar. Based on the ancient Egyptian reckoning. Recent recalculations suggest that Jesus was actually born closer to 4 BCE than to the year 1. How do Hindus feel when one of their members decides to leave the faith?
Membership in most smaller local Hindu communities across India is so intimately linked with a larger network of social and economic factors that the notion of leaving the faith is virtually meaningless. To live in the community is to be a Hindu. In the big cosmopolitan cities like Bombay, Calcutta, and Delhi, the matter is naturally more complex. Social relations are undergoing a higher rate of change in some places. But even there most people who think of themselves as Hindu will likely continue to do so. Whether or not they participate regularly in traditional religious observances. When individuals make a conscious effort to forsake the tradition altogether because they find that it no longer meets their needs, their families experience a sense of loss. One fewer member of the clan participates in the family's observance of the sacred occasions that have offered a sense of togetherness and joy. Individuals who drift away from traditional practice often continue to call themselves Hindu as a cultural identifier. And among immigrant families in the United States, for example, a surprising number of younger adults find themselves going in the opposite direction. Many feel a desire to return to the tradition because of an interest in their cultural roots. What is the Imperial Oath in Japan? The following oath is taken from the 1889 Constitution of the Empire of Japan. It was spoken by the Emperor in the Sanctuary of the Imperial Palace, we. The successor to the prosperous throne of our predecessors, do humbly and solemnly swear to the Imperial Founder of our House. And to our other Imperial ancestors that, in pursuance of a great policy coextensive with the heavens and with the earth. We shall maintain and secure from decline the ancient form of government. In consideration of the progressive tendency of the course of human affairs and in parallel with the advance of civilization. We deem it expedient, in order to give clearness and distinctness to the instructions bequeathed by the imperial founder of our house and by our other imperial ancestors. To establish fundamental laws formulated into express provisions of law, so that, on the one hand, our imperial posterity may possess an express guide for the course they are to follow, and that, on the other, our subjects shall thereby be enabled to enjoy a wider range of action in giving us their support. And that the observance of our laws shall continue to the remotest ages of time. We will thereby give greater firmness to the stability of our country. And promote the welfare of all the people within the boundaries of our dominions. And we now establish the Imperial House Law and the Constitution. These laws come to only an exposition of grand precepts for the conduct of the government. Bequeathed by the Imperial Founder of our House and by our other Imperial Ancestors. That we have been so fortunate in our reign, in keeping with the tendency of the times as to accomplish this work. We owe to the glorious spirits of the imperial founder of our house and of our other imperial ancestors. We now reverently make our prayer to them and to our illustrious father. And implore the help of their sacred spirits, 
and make to them solemn oath never at this time nor in the future. To fail to be an example to our subjects in the observance of the laws hereby established. May the heavenly spirits witness this our solemn oath. Are statues and other visual imagery important in Daoist and CCT temples? With the notable exception of major Confucian and imperial temples. Chinese ritual spaces are almost always filled with images of deities and other sacred figures. Principal deities occupy main altar spaces, but they often share the central spot with smaller images of other sacred figures arranged below the main image and toward the front of the altar. For many centuries deists and practitioners of CCT evidently felt no need for anthropomorphic depictions of their deities. The advent of Buddhism, with its growing iconographic repertoire, seems to have been an important factor in the development of Chinese religious representational imagery. Images of Deist deities, and of those that originated outside Deist circles but are often identified as Deist by association, run a wide gamut. Some of the deities are of divine origin. Others began as human beings, either historical or legendary. And achieved divine status either in life or after death. In addition to statues, colorful banners, low relief in stone and other media. And mural paintings depict mythological and other scenes meant to keep the worshipper in the proper frame of mind. Even temples that began as Buddhist institutions and which still display distinctively Buddhist imagery in their main shrines and altars have often become transformed into CCT temples by accretion over the centuries. Whatever the individual deity's life is to be, anthropomorphic images abound. Do Shinto practitioners celebrate sacred birthdays or honor particular figures? Many shrines hold special festivities in connection with dates important in the lives of enshrined kami who were historical figures prior to their deification. For example, the Akamajinku enshrines the child emperor and Toku. 1178 to 85, who reigned for the final five years of his very brief life. From April 23 to 25, celebrants recall his untimely death and the reign of his predecessor, Emperor Gotaba. Tenjin Matsuri, from July 24 to 25, celebrates the deified. Scholar and court minister Shigawara Michi Zane, 845-903. Over 10,000 branch shrines ritualize the deity who is mythically associated with oxen and cattle. According to tradition, Shigawara was born and came of age in the year of the ox and was saved from his enemy by a bull who miraculously appeared to kill his would-be assassins. Ironically, it was members of that same enemy clan, the Fujiwara who had Shugawara enshrined some 50 years after his death. 
he received the name Tenjin, Celestial Kami, and has remained popular as the Kami of Learning. Large numbers of worshippers still go to his shrines on the 25th. Both his birth and death day, of each month to reverence statues of reclining bulls. Rubbing them and then rubbing the blessing onto themselves or their children. Birthdays are not as important on the whole as our death. Anniversaries and seasonal associations with the deified figures. Are there any organizations or institutions that have their own? Distinctive structures of leadership within any of the branches of Hinduism? As in so many other traditions, monastic and other religious orders have played a major role in the history of the greater Hinduism. Different styles of monastic life have evolved in connection with the last two of the four traditional life stages. Namely those of forest dweller and renunciant. Individual Hindu males who have arrived at the last stage. That of sannyasi, have been crisscrossing India on their solitary ways for millennia. Since perhaps 25 centuries ago. Informal organizations developed as disciples gathered around renunciants renowned as spiritual teachers. These forerunners of stable monastic residences continue to welcome as occasional guests their unattached itinerant counterparts. Evidence of the earliest formal monastic organizations, from as long as 1800 years ago, suggests that they followed a strictly ascetic regime. But Chunkara, 788 to 820, is the first individual credited with founding an order. The renowned philosopher and theologian organized monasteries in sacred cities marking the four cardinal directions across India. Four subsequent orders were founded by religious leaders associated with four of the five major Vaishnava denominations, Ramanuj, Nimbarka, Madhva, and Vallabha. Important orders have arisen in the 19th and 20th centuries as well. Such as those founded by Raman Krishna and Mahatma Gandhi. Most of the orders have offered various levels of commitment. From temporary residency, to long-term affiliation of men and women with families, to lifelong celibacy. Is Mecca the only Islamic holy city? As the birthplace of Muhammad and the site of the Kabye, Mecca, and its immediate environs. Is naturally the holiest place on earth for Muslims. According to tradition. Other prophets and important holy people passed through Mecca as well. Abraham nearly sacrificed his son Ishmael at Arafat, the valley just outside Mecca, and built the Kabye. God rescued Abraham's consort, Hagar, and their son Ishmael from dying of thirst in the desert by causing the well of Zamzam to bubble forth. In 622 Muhammad traveled with his young community to Medina. And there established Islam as an all-encompassing social entity. From Medina, 
the Prophet secured access to Mecca for Muslims and in Medina he died. Muhammad's house and earliest mosque remain a regular stop for most pilgrims who make Hajj and Umrah. For these reasons and more, Medina ranks as second holiest city for Muslims. But Muhammad and a number of the other prophets also have important connections to Jerusalem. Muslim tradition has it that God carried Muhammad from Mecca to Jerusalem. To the farther mosque, where he met and led the other major prophets in prayer. From a spot nearby Muhammad began his ascension or miraj, pronounced miraj. For a time the young Muslim community in Medina faced Jerusalem when then prayed. But the orientation for prayer changed to Mecca in connection with a falling out with the local Jewish tribes. Nevertheless, Jerusalem has retained a special place in Muslim piety and remains politically sensitive real estate. How does the hierarchy among Shinto shrines work? Over the centuries Shinto authorities have devised a number of structures and classifications by which to distinguish various levels and functions of shrines. The most important is called the shrine rank system, Shekaku Saito. That has been in place since shortly after the Meiji restoration of 1868. Jing designates shrines of top rank under imperial auspices. Such as Meiji Jingu, in Tokyo, which enshrines royal ancestors, and Ise Jingu, which is at the top of the hierarchy and is called the Daijingu, Grand Imperial Shrine. Next in rank are the approximately 100,000 Jinjia. A generic term including virtually all shrines larger than little wayside structures. About 250 are included on a special list of highest ranking ones. Of these some 200 were designated prior to World War II as governmental shrines, Kansha. Many larger Jinjia have spawned affiliated or branch shrines called Buncha. Multiple shrines dedicated to a single kami generally constitute distinct families. With one shrine usually acknowledged as the original foundation from which branch shrines developed. Some very important Jinjia, such as Kajiga in Nara and about a dozen others, have the honorific title Taisha, Grand Shrine, roughly equivalent to Cathedral Basilica. They are also part of a cluster of 22 Niju and Isha, institutions elevated to special status. But even they are divided into three levels, seven high, seven middle ranking, and eight lower. That grouping arose out of the practice of ranking shrines within a given region according to their order of priority on pilgrimage routes, or to guide devotees intent on visiting a sequence of holy places. In various prefectures, a further ranking of area shrines simply lists them as first, second, or third shrine, acknowledging the three regional shrines that draw the largest crowds of worshippers. A number of Jinjia, some count 138, have been specially designated as nation protecting shrines. Gokoku Jinjia, because of their dedication to the souls of those who died in battle. 27 shrines within that category, also called deceased spirit invoking shrines. 
Shokansha, have been accorded a special rank because of the importance of the heroes from all periods of Japanese history that they commemorate. Tokyo's Yasukuni Jinji ranks at the top of that category. Before 1945, countless smaller local memorials represented the bottom of this hierarchical category. The main central administration is called the Association of Shinto Shrines. Jinjia Hancho, which has branches, called Jinjia Cho, in each Japanese prefecture. What rites do Buddhists practice at home? Many devout Buddhists pray daily at home before their domestic shrine. A miniature version of the temple or monastic oratory. They show reverence to the image of the Buddha with incense, flower offerings, and a lighted candle. All three of these simple symbols bring home the central realization of impermanence. They give pleasure to the worshipper, who should enjoy them while they last. Unburned incense is analogous a person who does not use his or her talents. A lotus flower is a reminder of the Buddha's being rooted in. The muck of real life but blossoming above it and in spite of it. These symbols also represent homage to the Buddha, not because the Buddha needs or enjoys that. But because it focuses the mind on his message. Rituals also include reciting the three refuges and reaffirming the commitment to the five precepts. Prayers of petition include the same sorts of things people of many traditions ask for happiness, success, longevity, and salvation. Mahayana devotees might wear a small rosary around a wrist, as they often do when worshipping in the temple. May women attend Muslim burial services? Women may attend funeral services at a mosque, though most mosques have separate sections for men and women. Sayings of the Prophet Muhammad recommend that women not attend. Burials because they might faint or lose control of their emotions. But the sayings stop short of barring women's attendance. How do Buddhists celebrate birth or initiation or other rites of passage? Buddhist tradition generally marks fewer of life's passages than say, Hindu tradition, and ceremonies are typically much simpler. Rites of passage also vary considerably from one region to another. Here are a couple of representative ceremonies observed. By some Japanese Buddhists of one of the Pure Land groups. A special celebration marks the child's seventh day of life. On the 100th day, the family gathers at the temple to symbolize the babies. Taking refuge in the three jewels and becoming a spiritual child of the Buddha. Some Pure Land Buddhists also acknowledge a variation on the theme of coming of age or puberty rite. The young man or woman stands before the altar and reaffirms the desire to adhere to Buddhist values. 
One symbol of the young person's attainment of adulthood is a white cloth inscribed Amida Buddha. There is no set day for these ceremonies. But they sometimes occur on anniversaries or when the chief abbot can be present. Rituals of death and mourning are the most important rites of passage for Buddhists generally. With nuptials perhaps second in importance. What role do angels play in Christian belief? Angels are spiritual beings with intuitive, though still partial, access to the ultimate truths. Roaming the universe at God's command, angels can make their presence known in countless ways. As messengers of the unseen world, angels represent God's ongoing communication with individuals on earth. Tradition divides angelic beings into three ranks or orders, each comprising three further choirs. In descending order, the first rank includes the seraphim, cherubim, and thrones. Second in rank are the dominations, principalities, and powers. Virtues, archangels, and angels fill the lowest three orders. Apart from archangels and angels, none of the angelic ranks descend to the human world. And the so-called guardian angels belong to the lowest rank. Michael, Raphael, and Gabriel are the only angels commonly named in Christian tradition. Many Christians consider themselves blessed and guarded by the presence of an angelic guardian. As the dramatic increase in colloquial American references to angels in recent times will attest. Even Christians whose traditions avoid talk of saints because their mediatorial role is deemed unnecessary now commonly talk of angelic intervention. Some perceive angels as kind strangers or as invisible forces that prevent accidents, for example. Do Christians practice any other forms of initiation ceremony? Confirmation, or chrismation as it is called in the Eastern Churches, has historically been closely linked with baptism, in some cases even conferred immediately afterward. But in some churches confirmation represents the remnant of an ancient puberty rite. In which the baptized Christian receives a special strengthening with the Holy Spirit. To the baptismal use of water symbolism, confirmation adds anointing and laying on of hands. As symbols of further sealing the candidate's full membership in the Christian community. In some Western churches a bishop administers confirmation. But priests can do so under some circumstances as well. Were Jews ever ruled by a monarchy? The thorny issue of monarchy arose during the later years of the judges, c. 1200 to 1000 BCE, who ruled Israel after Joshua had led the establishment of the people in the newly reached promised land of Canaan. Some argued that Israel should be like all the surrounding lands, each ruled by its own king. 
they saw no other solution to the lawlessness they believed had overcome their land. Others held on to the conviction that embracing the institution of monarchy would amount to a betrayal of God's sovereignty. Saul was the first king, R1020-1000. From his capital at Gilgal he succeeded in uniting the tribes against the common enemy, the Philistines. David, R1961, established himself first at Hebron. But after taking Jerusalem from the Jebusites declared that city his capital. He sought to unify Jewish religious life and instituted the office of court prophet. David's son Solomon. R961-922, further centralized Jewish ritual in his newly built Jerusalem temple. But when Solomon died his sons divided the realm into the northern kingdom of Israel. 922-721 BCE, and the southern kingdom of Judah, 922-586 BCE. 200 years later the northern capital of Samaria fell to the Assyrians, never to be recovered. The southern kingdom carried on for over a century, with moments of greatness. And even major religious reform in the late 7th century BCE. Many of Israel's principal prophets lived and worked under the kingdom of Judah. But Babylon was putting the squeeze on the small kingdom. And in 586 BCE Jerusalem and its temple fell to invading forces. Over a thousand years later, Jews founded the Hazar Kingdom in the Caucasus. A small-scale experiment in monarchy that survived from about 700 to 1000. Are there cyclical Shinto observances, such as feasts that happen regularly but not annually? Some gatherings still take place on set days in certain odd-numbered months, but not monthly. For example, a practice called waiting for the sun, Himachi, finds people gathered private. Residences on the 15th day of the 1st, 5th, and 9th lunar months to keep vigil until dawn. A Shinto priest is often among the celebrants. During the same months, but on the odd-numbered nights of the third week. People come together in groups awaiting the moon, Tsukamaki. September's full moon is especially beautiful. For it falls in the ninth month and is known as the harvest moon. Participants celebrate the lunar beauty with special songs and food. These gatherings occur only in homes. Some people still make special arrangements to observe their unlucky year age. 42 for men and 33 for women with rites at a shrine to ward off misfortune. They may take precautions by means of extra rituals of purification on that day. Some regard certain days each month as fortuitous connection days because they associate them with particular kami, and such days often occasion shrine visitation. What is a sage?
some religious figures are celebrated for their function as living repositories of wisdom. Popular lore may occasionally attribute a wondrous deed to a sage. But the emphasis is decidedly on the person's depth of understanding and insight. Sages are especially important in Jewish and Confucian tradition, for example. They are the people entrusted with preserving the ancient ways, not by mere rote. But also by injecting new meanings that allow adaptation to changing times. In some religious traditions, such as Islam and Hinduism, the religious scholar occupies a special place of honor. But these scholars function on a more practical level than the sages. And Confucian tradition even keeps the two categories more or less clearly separate. What is myth and why is it so important in the study of religion? Enduring myth and great poetry have one very important thing in common, both tell the truth without fail. That may come as a shock to readers accustomed to thinking of myth as a synonym for just a story at best. And outright lie at worst. Read a favorite poem aloud. Are there creation stories or other mythic elements in Shinto tradition? Two of the earliest of Shinto's foundational documents recount The story of the divine origins of Japan and its people in variant accounts, the Kojiki and Nianjoki tell of how Japan came into existence. But the myth is not so much a narrative of creation as it is of Japan's unique sacred history. The basic myth goes like this, in the beginning. Heaven and earth were as one, positive and negative unseparated. In a primal egg-like mass dwelt the principles of all life. Eventually the purer, lighter element rose and became heaven, while the heavier descended to form earth. A reed shoot grew between earth and heaven and became the one who established the eternal land. After some eons, two kami formed by spontaneous generation. Descending to earth on the floating bridge of heaven, is an Agya, the male who invites. And is an Amai, the female who invites, came into the world. In an image of sexual procreation. Is an Agya stirred the ocean depths with his spear and created the first lands. On the eight Japanese islands the union of the male and female produced the mountains and rivers. And thirty-five other kami. Last to be born was fire. The kami of heat, who burned his mother fatally during his birth. Is an agus slow fire with his sword, creating numerous additional kami in the process. The female fled to the underworld, the land of darkness. Desperate to prevent her husband from seeing her corrupted state. When the male followed and lit a fire so that he could see. She chased him out and blocked the entry to the underworld. Returning to the surface, the male immediately purified himself ritually. Ridding himself of the underworld's pollution. Corruption from his left eye formed the sun goddess Amaterasu, 
who rules the high plane of heavens. And from his right, Tsukiyomi, the moon, whose province is the oceans. From his nostrils he created the storm Kami, Suzanawa, withering wind of summer and ruler of the earth. Suzanawa soon made trouble for his sister, the sun, who took refuge in a rock cave. Needing the sun to return. The 800,000 Kami discussed how they might entice her from her cave. At length they resorted. To enlisting the terrible female of heaven to dance and shout obscenities to rouse Amaterasu's curiosity. They then offered her blue and white soft offerings, a mirror, and a bejeweled sakeka tree. She finally came out and dispatched her grandson Nineji to rule the world. His son in turn, Jimmu Tenno, became the first human emperor at age 45, on February 11, 660 BCE. Why do Christians put special meaning on the Ascension and Pentecost? Christ's ascension into heaven is commemorated on a Thursday 40 days after Easter. Tradition places the event on the Mount of Olives, to the east of Jerusalem. It was the culmination of a period of post-resurrection appearances. In which Jesus is said to have visited with his disciples. Christians have been observing the day since at least the end of the 4th century. Now, on the site traditionally connected with the event stands not a church but a small mosque. Ten days after the ascension, the Feast of Pentecost, 50, recalls how Jesus promised his disciples he would soon send a paraclete. Or advocate, to continue guiding the young community in his stead. Tradition identifies the Paraclete as the Holy Spirit. The Acts of the Apostles recounts how the disciples were gathered in an upper room when something like a storm enveloped them. And they experienced the power of the Spirit descending upon them in tongues as of fire. Many Christians refer to this event as the birthday of the Church. Since it gave the disciples the courage to emerge from hiding to preach the gospel far and wide. What gender related issues are important for religious Jews? Concern for ritual purity has occupied a central place in much of Jewish tradition. Beginning with the Torah's laws of holiness and continuing in the observance of the stricter branches of Judaism. Matters related to female fertility, menstruation, and childbearing, for example, have received a great deal of attention. According to scripture, menstruation renders a woman ritually unclean. As does the birth of a child, for seven days if a boy, fourteen if a girl. Gender has had significant implications in religious as well as social roles. Especially in orthodox and conservative communities. In modern times the question of whether women should become rabbis has arisen. Reform and reconstructionist communities do have increasing numbers of female rabbis. And the conservative Jewish Theological Seminary of America began accepting female candidates not long ago.
Orthodox communities still sponsor only men as candidates for the rabbinate. Are relics part of Confucian tradition? As important as ancestor veneration has been throughout Chinese history. One might expect relics to be a conspicuous feature in Confucian tradition. Confucians, along with Deists, Chinese Buddhists, and practitioners of CCT. Pay a great deal of attention to a variety of symbols associated with deceased ancestors. Those ancestors can be spiritual as well as biological. Forebears people like Confucius and the other sages, for example. But here tradition emphasizes the spirit and values of the ancestor. People do not focus on physical remnants of the individual. As though they contain the distillate of some special power. People visit graves of outstanding figures like Confucius as well as of their departed loved ones. But they do not go in hope of a miracle as devotees of. Other traditions might when making pilgrimage to the site of some powerful relic. Chinese tradition reveres the simple. Noble humanity and admirable personal qualities of those who have passed on. What are some of the main varieties of Shinto officials or specialists? Shinto tradition refers to the priesthood in general as either Shin's Hoku or Kanashi. Larger shrines with full priestly staffs distinguish among a number of ranks. The chief priest is called the Guji, generally the highest ranking local official. Guji might have oversight of up to 30 subordinate shrines. The Gonguji is second in command and oversees a staff of several lower ranks as well. Including junior assistant chief priests, Shin Gonguji. Senior priests are called Neki, assistant senior priests Gon Neki, and regular priests. Shutan or Kyujo, fill out the ranks of male staff. A national ranking system also distinguishes among priests by acknowledging their levels of learning with the equivalent of academic degrees, named purity, jokai, brightness, maikai, righteousness, sikai, and uprightness, chakai. Young unmarried women, called shrine maidens, maiko, function rather like deaconesses. Dressed in striking vermilion skirts and white blouses. They assist in blessing rituals, run the shrine shop, and perform sacred dance. Maiko traditionally begin their association with the shrine and training for service as sacred children. Highest in rank is the unique position called Saishu, found only at the ISE shrine and held by a woman. She is an imperial princess with the symbolic title Master of the Matsuri, Festivals. Assisting her is a priest with the rank of Daigyuji, Great Chief Priest, a function unique to ISE. In the imperial household, ritual specialists have either of two ranks. The Shoten parallels the shrine rank of senior priest. The Shoten Ho that of assistant senior priest. But the emperor himself or a personal delegate presides. 
much as the Chinese sovereign once did, at over two dozen annual ceremonies. Do Christians have a system of religious law? For over a millennium, church law grew from the earliest ad hoc responses to particular problems of practice and discipline to an elaborate system called canon law. Early ecumenical councils promulgated their decisions in the form of canons, or laws. Meanwhile, many major decrees from powerful bishops and formal opinions from important theologians added to the increasing body of legislation. Influenced by the codes of civil law of the Emperor Justinian and others. Medieval authorities began to systematize the massive and still expanding body of legal tradition. Gratian DC 1179 first began to impose order on the chaos and remained an important authority in Roman Catholicism until his work was thoroughly revised in 1917. Meanwhile, the Protestant Reformation brought about major changes in the new church bodies. Nearly all of the larger church organizations have developed legal structures of some kind to serve the concerns of what is called church polity. Often taking the form of articles, charters or conventions. The legal formulations of the various ecclesiastical bodies typically claim authority only within a particular family of churches. For example, the Southern Baptist, Northern Baptist, and National Baptist conventions have all developed distinctive legislative and procedural frameworks within which to handle matters of policy and discipline. What are some of the main of Confucian and CIT officials or ritual specialists? Strictly speaking, Confucians have no separate structure of ritual officials. Bureaucrats of the imperial administration were responsible for offerings performed in Confucian memorial halls. The emperor himself was the supreme ritual specialist in the sense that he exercised soul. Rights to perform certain ceremonies judged essential to the good order of life under heaven. All subordinate, regional, and local ceremonies were delegated to the various ranks of the literati. Today, even in the absence of imperial structures, government officials still play that role. In imperial times, the emperor's administration was divided into nine departments. Most important in this context was the Imperial Academy, whose chief officer was the Minister of Ceremonies. His function was similar to that of chief priest. Since he was responsible for rituals performed in all imperial temples, a common ritual at local imperial altars required that a newly appointed local magistrate stay overnight before his official installation in the temple of the spirit magistrate, a deity who was the earthly magistrate's celestial model. Is there a regular? Standard Shinto Group Liturgical Worship
communal worship is not a regular feature of Shinto liturgical practice. People may arrive at a shrine in large numbers. But they generally do not gather to worship as a large congregation. Individual and small group worship is the norm, whether for brief impromptu visits. Made outside the shrine or for more elaborate priestly rituals in the worship hall. A distinctive feature of Shinto architecture is the absence of worship spaces large enough to accommodate sizable congregations. By contrast, the bigger Japanese Buddhist temples accommodate sizable groups in a single worship space. Even in larger Shinto shrines. The parts of the worship facility open to the public are in any case not fully enclosed. Being very much at the mercy of cold weather is the price of wanting a sacred space to be as much in tune with nature as possible. This also reflects the underlying sense that people build community through other activities. But perform their most intimate spiritual duties as individuals or families. What was pre Islamic religion like, and did Islam retain any of its features? Pre Islamic Arabian tribes believed that the universe was animated by innumerable spirits, each inhabiting its own distinctive elements and natural features. They called each of these minor deities an Isla, God. But tribes people in many regions singled out one particular local power as the chief spiritual force. That power they called the God, Al Isla, or Allah, pronounced Al Laah. Mecca was one of several major cultic sites over which such a chief deity ruled. There, a peculiar cubic shaped structure called the Kabye stood for perhaps centuries at the center of pilgrimage traffic associated with a lively caravan trade. Pre Islamic beliefs also acknowledged the existence of numerous troublesome beings called jinns, as well as downright diabolical spiritual forces. Muhammad's ancestors emphasized the importance of following the moral code of tribal custom unquestioningly and did not believe in an afterlife. In his early preaching the Prophet focused on the need to behave morally and justly in light of the coming judgment. He taught that a divine will was more important than tribal custom, however ancient and gradually increased his condemnation of the cult of many spiritual powers, called polydaemonism. The Kabye remained an important symbol, as did the practice of pilgrimage. But Muhammad appropriated those aspects of tradition by underscoring their association with Abraham and Ishmael especially. What is the perfect realization school of Daoism? Founded by Wang Zhe, c. 1123 to 1170, also called Wang Chong Yang, the perfect realization. Chuan Zhen School is among the most important Daoist monastic orders. According to legend, Wang Zhe received new revelations from one of the eight immortals, Lu Dongbin. 
ascetic self-denial was a central feature in the order's discipline. Including meditative practices designed to maximize yang energy and minimize yin. The founder evidently insisted on the importance of studying the teachings of Buddhism and Confucianism along with those of Daoism. But focused on the characteristically Daoist spiritual goal of immortality. Of its several branches, the Lung Men, Dragon Gate, is perhaps the most influential. Like religious orders in some other major traditions. The perfect realization order historically has been socially active and responsible for preserving much traditional Chinese religious culture in times of turmoil. For example, they have done extensive refugee relief work and published a major edition of the Deist scriptural canon in 1192 from the White Cloud Monastery in Beijing. The Lung Men branch of the order continues its work today. Does Shinto tradition include pilgrimage? Pilgrimages of various kinds have long been important to Japanese in connection with both Buddhism and Shinto. Sacred natural objects and shrines are of course the most common goals of Shinto pilgrims. But people do not always make neat distinctions between Buddhist and Shinto sacred sites. What is most significant is that the place has been hallowed by some event or person of great influence in Japanese history or by natural qualities that betoken beauty and perfection. A distinctive aspect of Japanese pilgrimage is the formation of pilgrimage circuits. Junpai, that encompass multiple stops at sacred groves, mountains, caves, waterfalls, shrines or temples, in all imaginable combinations. Most common are circuits of either 33 or 88 sites set up in relatively recent times by railway and other transportation companies. In medieval times there was even talk of thousand shrine pilgrimages. Senja Mary, with multiple visits motivated by desire for greater spiritual merit. Some pilgrims undertake their journeys as acts of asceticism or spiritual discipline. But most seem to regard pilgrimage as an opportunity for reflection and spiritual renewal. A type of pilgrimage to Shinto's most sacred site, the ISE Shrine, has come to be known as the Blessing Visit, Okajmeri. Another popular pilgrimage circuit leaves by rail from Osaka and takes in sites associated with the seven gods of good luck. Including both Shinto shrines and Buddhist temples. Over 400 traditional pilgrimage routes still attract Japanese Buddhist and Shinto devotees.